her Jay's oops. microphone check. Hello, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Uh, Test, test, one, two, three. Ed, so I was like, oh, you out. Chat, test, test, test. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had coffee. Wakey, wakey. One, two, three. One, two. Oh, yeah, that's good. One, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. One, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. left well then You know me.
Good morning, Presbyterian Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Barbara. It's Saturday. I know we're all a bit tired and sleepy. Believe me, I'm somehow functioning at this hour when I usually don't. So at this time, we'd like to begin, and we would also like to welcome Pastor Eric Wiebe up. Well, good morning, Santa Barbara Mission Conference, 20th annual. I wanted to just issue a uh, warm and cordial welcome on behalf of First Presbyterian Church and really all the churches that are participating in this mission conference and make it possible. We're so glad to host this gathering, uh, not just here in person, but online and, and through these video resources. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are sitting in a renovated space. It has been uh, about 18 months in the, in the coming, and you all, last night, um, if you were here last night as we gathered, uh, those songs that we sang were the first songs sung by a congregation in this space since March 8th of 2020. Yeah. Not even our own congregation has has inaugurated this space yet. And I thought, as I was reflecting, and I heard Eben sort of being wonderful on the keyboard there last night, um, even before he started singing, I thought, how fitting, how fitting that Eben, representing all the wonderful community, community connections that you have, and all the wonderful ways that we, as a connectional community, are here, how wonderful that that's the downbeat of this space, this newly renovated space that literally is not just a place for First Presbyterian, it's a place for the whole community. It's a place for all of God's people to gather. So it's a really special thing. It's a really special thing to have you all here. Thank you. It's, it's really our reason for being. It's who we want to be as a church. Uh, that wonderful image that Eugene uh, ended with last night of the wonderful, diverse line of folks all standing up here, shoulder to shoulder, uh, representing the fullness and the grandeur of the kingdom of God. That's what we're all about. So thank you for being here on behalf of First Presbyterian Church. It's just a joy. And we hope that um, the 21st annual will see even further growth, that we won't have to be uh, full of masks on our face, and uh, we can be just uh, open and free to worship and to gather and to be led by the Holy Spirit. So once again, welcome we're so glad you're here. The conference organizers do a fantastic job of letting you know everywhere you need to go, where everything is. You have a host and the host badges. If you have any questions, I don't have a host badge on, uh, but you, now you know who I am, so you can ask me any question if you want. So thank you for being here. It's a joy to be gathered together in God's name. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome again people of santa barbara it's very quiet this morning guys can we get a little pumped do we want to get up stretch a little bit wake up a little bit you know stretch out the limbs you know we're getting ready to worship the lord sometimes you need a quick stretch because when jesus comes knocking it just knocks us out right <laughs> so today we have a pretty interesting day we got you know breakout sessions with the speakers uh, for those of you who are interested in specific uh, topics that will be taking place. We also have a prayer walk during lunch. For those of you who are interested, we'll be praying for the community of Santa Barbara. And we have speakers like Sandra Van Ospel and Eugene Woo! Cho. So we have, we have a lot of good stuff happening this day. Yeah, and we will be giving you a little bit of more details after our Q&A. So also be thinking about some questions as you hear Sandra speak today um, that come up. And also as you hear Eugene. And also when you are in your breakout sessions, I know there's going to be opportunities for you to engage with the speakers. So I just encourage you. We want to encourage you to definitely, if you have some, some questions, just go ahead and start thinking about those um, so that we can have them ready for our Q&A. And so as you know, our theme is being called to reconciled and the scripture that we've been reading over and over comes out of second of corinthians 5 and i just want to remind us that there is an invitation for each and every single one of us um, to be engaging and to be able to participate in what it means to be reconciled as one body and so i just want to encourage each and every single one of you to definitely just hear give the, give yourself the permission to hear to learn 
and to see where God is calling you to engage this morning and moving forward. So at this moment, we would like to introduce our amazing friend and pastor, Mickey Fenn, to come and pray for us. Good morning, everyone. Building on the prayer from Iona last night, pray with me. Believing that God made and loves the world, God was. Believing that it may be reshaped to fulfill God's purposes, God is. Believing that the future holds true reconciliation and peace, God will be. Today we gather and we pray, we worship and we listen. May your spirit, Lord, surround us today. Holy God, supporting us, guiding us, inspiring us, and comforting us, that we may understand and receive the work of reconciliation. Bless each and every presenter. Fill them with your spirit. Inspire them. Set them aflame, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Let there be healing where healing needs to be. And Lord, let us be empowered today and empowered for the rest of our life. Let all that happened today, Lord, glorify you. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. want us to reflect on sharing our faith this time in our own neighborhood the message version of john 1 14 reads that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood that we see in the life of jesus christ how he fully moves in to the lives of those around him and what about you that we would apply that same kingdom principle to may even be difficult to love around us but are there opportunities where God is presenting right before us? One example of how I learned this was with my mother-in-law, Marie, and it came out of a time of great grief and loss as her husband, my father-in-law, passed away. And then she moved into a new home, and shortly thereafter, her neighbor, Mike, noticed her lawn was a little overgrown, and he simply went across the street and introduced himself, learned a little bit about her story in life, and. And then he came back and started mowing her lawn just the next day. And upon doing that, Marie went outside with gratitude, but with a little bit of a question and, and just said, Mike, thank you, but why are you doing this? And Mike looked at Marie and he said, I'm so sorry for your loss. And in the Bible, in the book of James, it says that we're to care for widows and orphans. 
I don't know where you are with the Lord, but I feel like God wanted me to do this for you. And a tangible tool that I learned from that is number one, that we see a need, that we act on it, and that we have a gospel-centered answer of why. Because we don't know what someone else is going through. And then as Marie received what Mike had done for her, I learned another valuable, tangible tool, which is this, that we receive the invitation from our neighbors, that we receive and be built up ourselves because we see that in the life of Jesus as well. Yes, he acted and saw the needs and had a response for the kingdom of God, but he also received baptism. He also received invitation to go to other people's homes where he could proclaim and share the kingdom of God and that we would do both of those as we share our faith in our own neighborhood. Amen. It's so good to be back with you. And that warm introduction from um, Pastor Eric was just really moving to be able to um, get to lead worship in a space where people haven't gathered to, to sing in a long time. So um, what... What a happy thing to be doing. So let's, let's continue to pray and seek uh, the Lord together. We're going to sing a song we sang last night called We Seek Your Kingdom. And let this be a prayer um, for our lives and for this conference as we kick things off today. I invite you to stand as you're able. And I want to thank my wife for running slides. Thank you, Megan. Way in the back. Without the slides, you see no words.
Amen. We're going to sing uh, the Beatitudes now. So if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. And this is a, a great setting called The Kingdom is Yours. Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like a sky of falling stars. Blessed are the ones in mourning, brave enough to show the Lord their scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours.
Amen. I'm reminded of what Eugene said last night about hope being not this kind of cheap hope that doesn't see the pains of the world, but also sees beyond and sees the hope of God's future. And so I pray that you might be encouraged by that today. Um, I know that um, a lot of us are coming in from a really difficult year, and there's been um, a lot that we could be praying for healing of. And there's probably just a lot of open wounds and pain, even in this room, uh, not to mention outside in our communities. Um, this song is called Heal Us, Emmanuel. And it's an old hymn by William Cowper, who is one of my favorite uh, hymn writers. He coined the term, God moves in a mysterious way, if you've ever heard that before. Um, but um, resonate with his story of, of mental illness and the, the, the deep pains that he experienced and that he wrote from. He also wrote abolitionist poetry that Martin Luther King would frequently quote, um, and just um, one of my heroes of the faith. And um, so we're going to sing Heal Us, Emmanuel. I think you're going to catch on after a verse or two because it's pretty um, repetitive, but maybe this can be a prayer for you or somebody you know who is um, suffering and in need of healing. Um, and I am going to switch over to the keyboard.
touch you if we may. Oh, send us not despairing, oh, send none. Well, we're going to sing um, one more song this morning in worship. It's um, a rendition that comes from Psalm 23. Um, it's a beautiful song of just joy and praising the Lord for, for never leaving us, no matter what suffering we may go through, um, what injustices we may experience. And so would you join me in worshiping with this last song? with questions and our souls are restless you're our remedy we will follow you regardless we will sing your promise heaven's melody
Hallelujah, you never left us. Hallelujah, you never left us. Hallelujah, you never left us. Amen. It's fantastic. Thanks so much for leading us in worship, guys. Pardon my voice. Um, good morning. My name is Joy. It's my honor to introduce uh, Sandra Van Opstall this morning. Um, her list of accomplishments is long. Um, working with InterVarsity, with Young Life, with World Vision, with World Relief, with you name it. She's probably worked with them. She's uh, written some fantastic books, worship leader. Um, she's also an academic. She's also a mother of two seven-year-olds. Um, so she has a long list of qualifications to come and speak with us. But I'd like to emphasize that she's our fellow sister in Christ, that she is an image bearer of the Lord. And that is the most exciting reason why she gets to share with us this morning. So let's welcome her. If you would reach out your hands, she's sitting over here in this direction, and let's just say together, bless you, bless you. Because we want to bless her as she comes. And then if you would put your hands out to receive and say, we receive, Lord, what you have to speak through her. We receive, Lord, what you have to speak through her. So let's um, honor and welcome Sandra. Thank you, guys. You said you were going to receive, right? Okay, so I'm going to try to put this down because I will trip on these stairs. That's just going to happen if I stay up there. Um, worship team. Oh, my God. Don't make me cry before I have to preach. That's the worst. That is the worst. Um, I, I um, sang those songs, some of the songs you all sang just now as we traveled through uh, the summer of 2020 in our neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. Whew. I was not ready to go there again. So um, I just want to thank you guys for blessing us with that time of worship. So, right? Right? I was like, calm down, Sandra. You're not on the west side. Calm down. Don't yell while you're worshiping. Okay. So, um, just so you know, I may come closer to you, but I am vaccinated, boosted. I had COVID over Christmas. I am like, I'm going to go to Disneyland after this, you know, um, and touch all the things there. So, yes, bios are so weird. So you have them in your booklet, but I want you to know the most important thing that was shared about me is that I am the mother of two seven-year-olds because, oh my gosh, the last two years, remote learning and all. So, um, and the other most important thing to know about me is that I have a mother that is that came from Colombia from South America and a father that came from Argentina and so being the, the daughter of a Colombiana and being the mother of two seven-year-olds you know that I have had the Encanto soundtrack on repeat since December right you all know that it's like been over and over and over again and as we have been living this life that we've been living and as the soundtrack has been going in my car over and over I just I'm really feeling some strong Luisa vibes you know it's pressure that'll drip, 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 and it'll never stop. Whoa. You guys don't know the song? You know, catch up. It's pressure that'll tip, 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 till you're ready to pop. Whoa. -oh. Right? Over and over. And not like in a cute way, but like, <laughs> give it to your sister because your sister's stronger. You're like, I mean, the whole song is about this pressure that this woman is carrying. And she lifts mountains and she lifts churches. And every time I'm in the car and I hear that song, I start to cry. And my little sons are like, what is going on, Mom? I'm like, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard. I do lift churches. I do. I do. I carry them. You know, um, and I'm just like melting in the car because of the song. And what I realize is that that movie and those songs not only gave us uh, permission to... Uh, <sighs> to laugh a lot because it did, it's fun. they're funny movies, but it really gave us an, an opportunity to ask questions about the kinds of families we belong to. And while I don't think that institutions, hear me clearly, I do not believe that coworkers and institutions are families. I do believe that the body of Christ is a family. That's what the scripture says we are. And we, as a family, in our baptism and communion are brought together into this beautiful and frustrating thing called the body of Christ. And over the last few years especially, I think that we have seen how much healing and change we need. 
So this time that we come together and say we're called to be reconciled, we're called to be the, in the ministry of reconciliation, and it's happening in a time in our country and in our world where all these things are being revealed about where things really are. And this movie comes out, and everyone's like, I just need to talk to my sibling, I need to go to therapy. We all should be working through those things. But the church has not actually leaned in to that movie or to that concept to say this beautiful and frustrating family that we're in that has experienced racial and economic disparities that have impacted that are impacted by centuries of abuse and decades of international policies and intentional policies that disenfranchise communities this is the legacy that we're in and the role of the church and the division of the north american church has been particularly exposed the data shows us how far from the practice of solidarity we are. The data shows us that no matter what we read on a Sunday morning or by ourselves in our room about the nature of who we truly are in Christ as one body and one people and one family, we are not living that out. Survey says we're not. And those things have been exposed. So, as we head into today's scripture, I want to invite us to a word of hope from Acts 15. Because I think as we think about this being a missions conference and the theme being called to reconcile, Acts 15 actually gives us the greatest snapshot of how those things work together. And continuing in Luke, which uh, Pastor Eugene did yesterday, in the story of Luke from Luke, the Gospel of Luke into Luke 2, which is also called the Acts of the Apostles, what happened after Christ died, we're going to continue with that same writer, that same author, that same theme. So here's what's happening in Acts. Here's what's happening right now, and then I'll we'll read the passage. God has been doing some amazing things among the Gentiles. The conversion of Cornelius' household had already brought some problems in Jerusalem. He already had to go up to Jerusalem to explain what had happened there. In Acts 11, 1 through 3, it says that the circumcised believers criticized him, Peter, for doing what God had told him to do. And Peter explained what God had done, but not everyone was satisfied. Even though it was something that was promised in the scriptures since the beginning, it was disorienting for them. They didn't like it. How infuriating, right? Can you imagine being Peter? Can you imagine being in this experience where you have this like freaky vision and all of a sudden, like, these animals come down on a, on a claw, you, and the Lord's like, go to the places where you don't think you should go. And Peter's like, no, I will never do that. And the Lord's like, yes, go. And finally he goes, and he does what is right, and then he comes to give testimony of this experience that he's had. Everyone's like, mm, you know, you shouldn't have done that. So now he's on trial? Can you imagine what he's going through? This is what happens to many of us especially as we think about what is happening, what the Spirit is doing in emerging leaders within the church. This happens for many of us who are trying to reform and reimagine how God's people ought to live into solidarity, this solidarity and reconciliation which we're called to. One of the main themes of Acts is the coming together of Jews and Gentiles into one family, along with the radical inclusion of those who have been ethnically, economically, and socially marginalized, God's plan, hear me, God's plan was always to bring together all things under Christ. And it was a potent sign to the principalities and the powers that God is God. That's how people knew that God is God. Only God can work that miracle. The potent witness of the people of God that shakes the powers and principalities. Because the amount of emptying it takes to create this type of family can only be led by the one who emptied himself. Think about our history in our world. Think about our history in our countries that we come from and in our own here in the U.S. 400 years of evil, intentional dehumanizing. You think that someone's intellect and new proposals of how to do this thing is going to fight that? It only takes the power of the one who emptied himself to bring that kind of liberation and freedom in the church. That's what's happening in the book of Acts. These weird things that are disrupting and bothering people. 
and causing people to have to face trial. So here's Acts 15. I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to take a chance. I know it's Saturday morning, but close them. Students, if you need an app, take it now. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted, and this news made all the believers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he told us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the neck of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No! We believe that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling all the signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how the God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, as it is read in the synagogue every Sabbath. This is God's word. So in Acts 15, we see that when the spirit disrupts, when the spirit disrupts, we're invited to lean in. God's work among the Gentiles caused so much disruption, but Paul and Barnabas challenged. The passage says, and I quote, they brought sharp dispute and debate. And I want to pause here and just say something as we're doing this ministry of reconciliation, as we are called to reconcile, that there are leaders, when the Spirit disrupts this thing that we think is the church, that we call the church, there are leaders that come in sometimes and bring sharp dispute and debate. And you know what this passage says they did when they brought that debate? They didn't silence them. They sent them. They didn't silence them. They sent them. They said, yes, go to Jerusalem and work this out. And I think that's a beautiful thing that I don't see very often, honestly. I get silenced a lot, y'all. A lot. I'm like on all the lists, you know, as enemy of the church. She's a heretic. She's a Marxist. You know, like, I'm like, I don't know where this comes from. I don't know. I literally, I, I, I'm not that smart to come up with these theories. I'm just like here reading scripture, trying to figure out the life of Jesus. Um, I get silenced a lot, but here they don't get silenced. And I felt it in my bones. Like, can you imagine a space in our churches when we're doing this thing called reconciliation and solidarity where we don't police and silence one another's experiences? Can you imagine that? How freeing would that be? Where, that we could speak truth to power and stat challenge the status quo. And in some spaces, just even imagining a new way is threatening to people. I know this even just from my work with worship. 
I've been writing on the issue of how do we create spaces that are inclusive in worship since like 2008 or nine. And every time I write something, it's like, well, we, we couldn't do that. Like we couldn't possibly, what would we do with ourselves? And I'm like, it's literally just imagining a new way forward. But yet people get stuck. They don't lean in. Don't we see this all the time? We see people policing the work of the spirit when God is doing something. When we see particularly Western whiteness continuing to normalize its ways of preaching and worship and church governance and, and even mission. There's one way to do things. It's our way. Everything else is hyphenated. It's black gospel worship. It's Latina theology. It's urban ministry as opposed to just ministry. Right? So we have a way that we like to normalize things, and, and Pastor Eugene talked about this a lot, but I see it every time I click on leadership and ministry conferences and gatherings, when the data shows us, the data shows us that 48% of all student-aged folks, so students in this country are non-white. And yet, when I see these gatherings, the resources, the experiences, the speakers, the perspective that rep they represent does not at all represent the families or the students that are the future of this country. So it's not that people are saying, hey, your Latina church can't come to this conference, but you can come to this conference, but this is what we're going to teach you. And it doesn't at all reflect your theology, your experience, your songs, your history, your trauma, your suffering, your joy, come and learn from us and we'll normalize what is right for you. That's why we actually have to create all of our children's curriculum in our neighborhood. This is how we see it. When the spirit is disrupting, when the spirit is moving, when the spirit is creating new things and we just don't lean in. The story of disruption is being told by a Gentile to Gentiles about a Gentile experience. We should always pay attention in a, in a passage. I love Bible study, you guys. Raise your hand if you love Bible study. Okay, I'm not the only one, all right. You should always pay attention to who is writing, who they're writing to and what, in what context they're writing about. So can you imagine being a Gentile overhearing this story or even being present in this experience and you're hearing them have this discussion? Imagine how liberating it must have been to hear that since the beginning of time, since the beginning of this thing that God created, he always had this intention of including all the nations that we as non-Jews, many of us in this room, we as people that are often marginalized in our own societies have full inclusion and full participation in this thing called the gospel. And as Pastor Eugene said uh, yesterday, that this invitation to salvation was something beyond what we even talk about today when we say God has brought salvation. Because in the book of Luke, Whenever the author Luke uses with, within the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts the word salvation, the word salvation encompasses deliverance, liberation, healing, and flourishing. It's not about someday far away. It's about how we experience this reality now. It's about how you understand yourself as a person created in God's image. And so when we hear that word, imagine the Gentiles that were present hearing that word and saying to themselves, this is what God says to me. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. That's where those songs come from, the authors of those songs, y'all. Musicians of color living through this last two years, writing out of their experiences. This is the hope that is in this passage. When the spirit disrupts, we lean in. We're invited to lean in. Reconciliation requires reckoning. Reconciliation requires reckoning. So turn to your neighbor and say, it requires reckoning. It requires reckoning. This disruption invites the people of God to discern in Acts 
15. You see that they are gathered together in this community. They're gathered together in community, not two people in an office making decisions for everybody else. They're gathered in community and in the power of the Spirit to observe the Word and the work of God. They're gathered in community in the power of the Spirit to observe the Word and the work of God. The first thing that this passage invites me to see is that when disruption came, when they were confused, when God was doing something they didn't understand, they came together and they listened. There's not a whole lot of that going around today. Not a whole lot of listening. But they listened. They came together, and there were three speeches given that I want to point out. Three speeches given. First, Peter, for the second time. Y'all, now Peter's like, you want me to come back again and tell my story again? Okay. Peter, for the second time in Jerusalem, testifies again that their faith was genuine because they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, just as it had been given to the Jerusalem disciples. And Peter's like, listen, I know that feels offensive to you. Like, I know that feels offensive to you, but I was there, okay? I had the vision. I witnessed it happen. The Spirit came upon them. This is what happened. I don't know what to tell you guys. And Peter repeats this testimony again. And after Peter's testimony, the assembly went silent. Isn't that what we ought to do? <laughs> when we gather together and come in community and someone shares something that is disruptive to our understanding of who God is, that is outside of our categories and boxes of what we understood, not because God has changed, but because we were disoriented already. When someone shares a testimony like that, shouldn't we all in our small groups, at our churches, in our communities, shouldn't we all just stop and listen and receive like our sister asked us to, to receive? They were silent. Then Paul and Barnabas, two witnesses, which makes this credible in the courts, right? In the Jewish courts, two witnesses came and testified and shared about what God had done among the Gentiles, verse 12. And they said that their experiences were consistent with Peter's. This is what God has done, right? So Peter testifies, they go silent. Paul and Barnabas says, me too, me too. Let's make this official. It actually happened. It's credible. And then James speaks up and says, hey, listen. I love that passage. Like, I feel like if any of you have ever been in a, Family, like if you're Latina or Egyptian or something, you're like, hey, listen to me. You're like, you got to get your voice out there because there's no pauses anywhere. You know, <laughs> listen, this is, I hope you feel the energy of this council. It's like, next, who wants to speak next? And I was like, oh, have you ever been in the Middle East? It's like, everyone is talking probably at the same time, you know, trying to get a word. Listen to me, Pete, uh, James says. The prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, he quotes from Amos 9, As after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name. Says the Lord who does these things. James is like, look, y'all, I know that we haven't seen something like this in a hot minute because we weren't really understanding what God was telling us to do in the first place. I know that we had disoriented our faith to be about us and our own group and our own flourishing and our own situation. I know that this feels alarming to us, but I'm just here to say that God told us this from the beginning. 
In Amos, it says, even in the Gentiles who bear my name. And in this passage, the word for people that is used in Acts 15 is actually a word that is reserved for Hebrew people, for the people of God, not just people, but people, the people. And that's the word that's used in this passage. And so you see the Holy Spirit present in this community as they observe the work and the word of God. I hope you're preparing the work that the Spirit did through Peter and the word of God which they have before you. They said, let's figure this out together. Let's not center your experience or your theology or your perspective. Let's come together under the Spirit and be liberated to imagine together what God is doing in this place. Can you imagine that in the church today? Y'all turn on the television when you get back to your, but it's crazy. We're not listening to each other. We're not centering the majority church. Did you guys know that the North American church is only 10% of the entire global church? Why are we everywhere? Why are our books translated into every language? Why are our worship songs the hottest on Spotify? What is going on? We ought to come together in community and observe the work and the word of God under the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be liberated and free to do this thing called solidarity and reconciliation. Now, people are listening to James and they heard the two testimonies, so they're like, oh gosh, I guess we gotta listen to it because it's true now. Peter comes back here and tells his story again. You know he hated those people. So he wasn't about to like be like, yeah, let me be around the Gentiles. Like, so he had some kind of conversion. Something is going on here. And the people that Google Maps and all the algorithms had taken them around. That filth is now in the church. Those violent people are now in the church? Those rapists and murderers and illegal people who cross our borders are now in the church? Those people who have funny names and don't speak our language, they're now in the church? Yeah. That's what God said he would do. And to us, not only is that true, but now we are the margin of the global church. So I hope the rest of the global church is reading this passage because otherwise <laughs> the center has moved, y'all. I hope they're also reading this passage and saying, oh, those Americans, we'll still let them in. <laughs> I know they live lives that are selfish and narcissistic and individualistic and greedy. We know they consume most of the world's food and most of the world's goods, and they just throw them away. We know they have perspectives on us. We know they don't listen to us. We know we don't matter to them. We know that we're only a mission field and never a partner, but we'll still listen to them. I hope they're reading this. Please, if you're, if you're overseas somewhere and you're listening to this, please let us in, okay? Please include us. We have experiences and theology that has formed us from our location. The question we need to ask ourselves, is a scripture centered when we have to make the collective de decisions? Are we attentive to the Spirit's process and work when we're making these collective decisions? Is there someone missing when we're making these collective decisions? Do we under even understand what we're looking at and what we're trying to solve for? when we're coming together and discerning the future of the church? Do we have the right people in the room? I actually thought about this when I was driving in today. I'm not from California, I'm from Chicago. That's, I'm from the west side, I'm from Chicago. Um, that's also maybe why I'm yelling, just so you know, that's how we do it. Um, I, I'm always struck when I come to California how clear and potent the history of colonization in our country is in California. One mile to Santa Barbara Mission, two miles to, like, it's just, it's in the street names, 
It's everywhere. The clarity of Spanish colonization of the indigenous peoples that lived on this land is so clear to me. I'm like, and I get like, oh, like, oh my gosh, it's so sad. Oh my gosh, it's so, oh my gosh. Gosh, how do people live here? Like, this is my experience of California, everywhere, up, up and down the coast. How do people live here with that in their face all the time? Like, just in their face. But my guess is when you're around it enough, you normalize it. It just becomes a street name. Not meaningful at all. You may come to my city and see things and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And I've normalized those things. People come from all over the world and they come to our, and they read our books and they come to our seminaries and like, this is what Christianity is over there? Oh my gosh. That's not how we, why are they so quiet? Where's the Holy Spirit? Right? I don't think anyone is wrong or right. I just think we're different. The problem is that when we normalize one person's perspective, we become disoriented. And so reconciliation requires reckoning and reconciliation requires reform. It requires reimagining. It requires change. And so in this passage, you see this immense, immense thing that's happening in the passage where people are changing their perspectives. They're being liberated, they're being freed. Have any of you ever had that experience where you've like been in the word with someone else of a different generation, different class, different ethnicity, and you're reading scripture together and you're like, I never saw that there. I was studying the book of Amos at Stateville Prison in Illinois, which is a maximum security, like life sentence. You know, you have a maximum security life sentence if you're there. There's a program that North Park University has in there. It's called the Masters of Restorative Arts. And so I take classes, I teach, I do things in there. And so I was studying the book of Amos. I was actually prepping for a conference. And I said, let me ask my brothers what they see here. And we're studying the passage, and we're studying the passage. And at one point, my brother leans over to me, and he's like, listen, Rev Rev. They call me Rev Rev, Rev Revolutionary Reverend. Rev Rev, listen, Amos is not that angry. I was like, what do you mean? And I was like, ah! You know? And he said, that's, Amos is not angry at the people. Amos is, is hurting for the people. Amos is longing for the people. It's like my abuela, man. When I was little, and my abuela used to say, don't go out there. There's nothing good for you out in those streets. There's nothing good. Please, mijo, please, my son, stay home. Please, I don't want you to get in trouble. Please, I want you to be safe. Please, I want you to make good decisions. Please, I don't want you to be affected by what's out there. Please return. Return. That's the heart of Amos. The loving kindness of a God who wants God's people to return and seek justice and good. Not a God who is angry. I was like, oh, dang, I never saw it that way. But you're right. He's a shepherd. He goes into, he's a shepherd. He's, a, he's also a spoken word artist. So uh, he's like, he's a shepherd. He takes care of trees. He's, he's like, he's got like, he's like a tender hearted nurture. I was like, okay. Okay. I'm, so, I'm in there like, I've been studying Amos for 10 years. I did it in Hebrew, in seminary for two years. I mean, I've been 10 years of Amos. I never heard the tone that way. When we want reconciliation, but reconciliation requires reform. It requires change. It requires centering the voices of other people who have often been silenced and unheard and unseen so that we could truly understand what is happening in the world and what the scriptures are calling us to in that particular day, in that particular context. You know, I wish we could say, like, this passage is so lovely. At the end, they, like, made the right decision. They said, okay, no, circumcision, no. You know, but, like, anything revolved around idolatry or anything that makes it difficult for the Jews to be in relationship with you, like, let's just keep around that, those things that allow you to be in fellowship, the things that keep communion and fellowship and the things that keep you from idolatry, but no circumcision, that's cool. And they all lived happily ever after. No, like, actually, later on, you know, Paul and Barnabas are now fighting. Like, people are just fighting, you know? This passage is lovely, but it also shows that even though they did a good job, 
in some parts of Acts, they still were not done. That's why reconciliation requires reform. Because even though your churches and your fellowships and your student groups and your family has done a good job, we can always do better. We are a people of reform. We are a people of change and transformation, renewal, regeneration, whatever words you want to use. We are always changing in the power of the Spirit. So we come together in community under the power of the Spirit to observe the work and the work, Word of God. But something in this passage really disturbed me. So I'm going to bring this out. I'm not going to talk a long time about it, but it really bothered me. I was like, you know, the book of Acts is narrative, which means that not everything that's in it is, is prescriptive. Some of it's just descriptive. It's just telling us what happened. It's not saying you should do it this way. And so we have to discern together. So here I am in the book of Acts, and I'm like, something's really bothering me about this passage. And I'm a Latina, woman, Pentecost, Reformacostal minister in a white evangelical space. And I thought to myself, I know exactly what's bothering me. I was triggered by this passage. Why did they have to have them go to Jerusalem? As if God couldn't discern things where they were? They had to go to Jerusalem. It's kind of like, let's have our council. And everyone flies over from around the world to the states, to the mission's headquarters. And the mission headquarters and tells them what to do and they all fly back. Why? I'm triggered by that. So like, why did they have to go to Jerusalem? And why was it just all these Jewish men making the decision for Gentiles? How is this just? Right? So I thought to myself, oh, they have a long way to go. And they, they correct those things in the book of Acts. If you keep reading, they correct those things. In the time, I'm like, Peter, you did such a good job. You're such a great ally. Thanks for standing up and taking one for the team. You know, speak on behalf of the Gentiles. Paul Barnabas, great job. You're always, you've been an ally for a long time. Thanks for speaking on our behalf. I really appreciate that you, you speaking for us, you know. James, thank you for like, what great job speaking for us. You know, also we can speak for ourselves. We could tell our own stories. We have voices. And so I see in the book of Acts, in this passage, that even though they did a great job, they could have done better. Instead of deciding for the Gentiles what can happen for the Gentiles, they could have changed the system and said, let's let the Gentiles speak for themselves. That's what I think is happening in our churches right now. That's what I think is happening in our academic institutions right now. That's what's happening in our cities right now, on, uh, on boards of organizations and, and, and companies, Fortune 500 companies, that people from that have been marginalized, silenced, and told what to do, are now saying we can speak for ourselves. It's not about not wanting to hear you. It's not about de de devaluing you. It's not about belittling you. It's about being fully present with you. There is room at the table of reconciliation. And so if we only have one table with eight seats and we keep trying to make that place more diverse and more equitable and more just and more inclusive, it's never going to work. We just have to put some leaves in the table or just get rid of the table altogether and throw some pillows on the floor like most of the world. The book of Acts gives us an invitation not only to discern and to reckon, but also to reform. It shows us something that's happening in here. Sometimes the church got it right, sometimes it didn't. But we are a people of transformation and reformation. So as I look at what's happening on church boards and in academic institutions and in preschools, that I mean, I work with so many people. As I look at what's happening, I'm just like, what, is, why, what are we afraid of? What, what are we afraid of when a young person of color comes into our church and says, I don't like the way we're talking about this. I don't like that you're using the word violence and riot to describe what's happening in my generation. I want us to consider it this way. How long do you want me to put my head down and go forward? How long should I assimilate to the ways that my company is asking me to do things? When they're raising those questions because of their love for Jesus, because of their perspective on Scripture, because they have finally understood what it means that they are made in God's image and gifted 
and they have agency, why are we silencing them? So they're angry. I'm angry too. Shouldn't we all be angry when children are separated from parents? Shouldn't we all be angry when our refugee and immigration systems are causing some of the world's highest numbers of sex trafficking we've ever seen? Shouldn't we ang be angry when kids in our schools are not even like learning? Shouldn't we be angry when we went through what we did with remote learning and realized how much disparity there is and inequity there is in our education system? Shouldn't that make us want to do something different? Shouldn't that want to make us be different? No wonder people around the world are looking at us going, what's happening over there? Now they want to send missionaries over here? No, thank you. We don't need that. We're just fine without you. That's what happens when people try to send teams to my neighbor. I'm like one of those churches that you all come to visit, you know? We get like all the serve teams and the universities and all the Christian colleges in our area. And I'm just like, here they come. They think they're going to save us by painting a wall incorrectly that we have to repaint when they leave. <laughs> by petting our children on the head and playing with their hair when they're not supposed to. But like Pastor Eugene said, I, I, think, there's a, I think there's a way to do those trips right. I think there's a way to have proximity and mutuality right but come into my neighborhood and try to touch my children's hair. Try. Come with your, one of your teams and try to tell me what you think you're going to do at our church versus what we need you to do at our church. Come. So then, what, what's the perspective? Oh my gosh, can you believe that church? They're just over, they're not even thankful. They just, they're not even receiving the VBS we want to bring them. I'm like, you have, literally the VBS doesn't make sense here. That stuff doesn't make sense here. Our children all have PTSD. That's not how they see the passage. And David wasn't white, y'all. We don't need that. I can't tell you what we do need. I can't tell you what we can teach. You want to bring a bunch of church planters into our, into our neighborhood? And we'll put on a church planting conference for you. We'll teach you how to plant a church with no money and how to reach out to a neighborhood in a way that doesn't just save their souls, but their whole being in person. We'll teach you that. You want to come? Let's have mutuality. Let's have reciprocity. Let's be reconciled one to the other. Right? Then we get like, I don't like that, those people over there, right? But why are we afraid of change? Why are we afraid of that relationship changing? Why are we afraid of the reimagining of worship in our churches? We're afraid of those things because we see a transfer of power. I have a lot of discussions with guys. I'm in a, in a doctoral class. And a lot of times people, well, this actually happened in seminary too. They're like, I feel called to be an urban pastor. I'm like, okay. I feel called to be an urban pastor. Okay. I feel called to plant a multi-ethnic church. Okay. I, I don't know. I just met them. I don't know if they are called to do that or not. And then as we talk about it, I'm like, oh yeah, like we actually don't need you to come to our neighborhood and plant anything. We just had seven churches planted in the last two years. We don't need any of them. We needed you to come and pastor under the leadership of the, of the churches that already exist. So if God gave you a call to do that thing, whatever that thing is, start that nonprofit, become a pastor, do that you know, service project, why is it that you have to be in charge of it? Just because God called you doesn't mean God called you to be in charge. That's the kind of reform we need to be asking ourselves. Everyone is called. We all have a place. We should be practicing reconciliation and mutuality. We should be discerning together. But, recon but reconciliation requires that kind of reorientation where we're asking ourselves, who is at the center of this journey? That's why for Chasing Justice, for example, which is the organization that I, I left, I left my pastoral job to do this organization, and it's really trying to help young leaders under 30 understand what it's like to live a lifestyle of justice. And it is only led by black, indigenous, and other people of color. 
Everyone participates, everyone dialogues, but the teachers and the leaders are people of color. Why? And Global Voices, why? Because for at least four centuries of the, Amer of the North American church's experience, we have been marginalized and silenced. It doesn't mean our brothers and sisters don't have anything to say. It means there are seven other justice movements that are led by white folks. And so we're trying to complement that experience. Development agencies, mission agencies, justice conferences, all those spaces that are not led by people who are most impacted. Their boards are not led by people who are most impacted by injustice. Their presidents and their cabinets are not led by people who are most impacted by injustice. So we are saying in this space, we want those who are most impacted by the injustices of the world to voice a new way forward. And the rest of us will follow, including this old lady. I don't like half the things they do. But I'm like, you guys are in charge, okay. <laughs> I'm not under 30. <laughs> Let's find a way forward. Clearly we didn't do it right. Clearly my generation didn't have the way. So I will be here to support you. I will be here to guide, but the decisions are yours. Let's come together in community under the power of the Holy Spirit and discern the word and the work of God. My prayer and my passion is that none of us in the church miss out on what God is doing by God's Spirit, that we lean into the disruption and that we reform and reorient together. Jesus, I thank you so much for your word. It is such an encouragement to see how you work in your people, even when your people are not perfect. And we thank you that there's a way forward. And we thank you that this way forward is not empowered by our intelligence or our capacity or our capability, but empowered by the work of your spirit and the authority of your word. We pray, especially over this neighborhood, over this city, over the churches and fellowships and colleges that are represented here, that you will bring reckoning, reform, and reorientation to this space, God. That when these people live their lives, open their mouths, demonstrate and proclaim the gospel, that all will know that the powers and principalities will be shaken because they will know that you are God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sandra, so much. We're going to give um, a brief five-minute break so that you can come up with your questions. If you need to use the restrooms, um, our hosts are there. But we're going to come back for a Q&A. And for our people online who are watching, we would love you to go ahead and ask questions. We already have a couple of them. So if you want to continue to ask questions, please do. And then we'll be back in about, there's a timer, in four minutes and 41, 40 seconds. 30, 39, 38, 37, 36. 34. I mean, time stops running, guys. Time stops running. Sorry. Well, my mic's still on. <laughs> Hi. I'm, I work with international students. Oh, great. And I brought oh. two amazing students here from Davis, UC Davis. She's a climate uh, justice advocate in Brazil and then focuses on racial reconciliation. Okay. And he works uh, in the ministry in the favelas. So I want to introduce you to them sometime.
And then, all right. When you okay. hear the stories, then you you know what. Awesome. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't turn no, no, me no. on yet. Well, we're actually going to invite okay. you to come up because you are going to answer some Q and A. Yeah. For us. Awesome. So thank you to our online participants who have sent questions. But again, we want to open it up to our audience too. So if there's a question in our audience, my beautiful husband, this handsome. This is true. This is Husband true. Husband will go to you, and this he will go true. ahead and um, share I am the mic. Beautiful. That's true. <laughs> That's true. All right. So I do have a question from online, Sandra, for you, and this is what it says: um, How can white sisters and brothers better hear um, the Black Indigenous people of color when they do not speak with an assimilated, white, normalized tone and voice? I feel empowered when I hear Sandra speak with a strong Latina and Latinx voice. I've heard her speak with even more ferocity, only to restate <laughs> it in a white tone of a voice to help people hear her. So I guess it's for people yeah, of color. Yeah, so, so let me deal with that question specifically about me. Um, so I grew up in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, like in an incredibly affluent white space. So my parents moved us from the city when I was six, five or six. Um, I didn't speak any English. I was Spanish dominant and I had only grown up in a, in a Latina community. So I had to learn through my school age years how to speak both languages and understand both cultures. And there are actually many of us, if you're, if you're a person of color and you're in a university setting, you're already, it's just, you're already code switching. That's called code switching. Um, it means that you're able to move from one culture to another culture almost seamlessly. Um, and both are part of you. So uh, my mom always used to tell me like, oh, mira, Sandrita. Like my mom mostly talks to me in Spanish. She's like, you know, you can take the girl out of Buffalo Grove. That's where I grew up. But you can't take Buffalo Grove out of the girl, which means like I'm super entitled. Like if I go to a restaurant and something's not like the way I like, like it, I just say it. You know, like I'm like, I don't like this. this isn't. And I feel like that, I'm paying money. You know how expensive it is to go out to eat? I don't do it very often. So if it's not right, I want it right. And she, she thinks that's, in a, culturally, she thinks that's inappropriate. You don't want to make a scene like that. I'm like, because she's Colombian and they're very kind and nice. And I'm like, no, I, this is like the way. So she tells me I grew up in an entitled, wealthy, white space where I just asked for it. And, and that's how she sees it. She sees it as inappropriate, whereas I see it as agency because that has impacted me. So those are both a part of who I am. Does that make sense? So like when I don't get what I want, I fight for what I want. And that is usually the mark actually of someone who has privilege. Someone who has privilege economically, racially, or socially speaks directly. Um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this in, in his book, Outliers, um, about class, that people that grow up in upper class settings, regardless of race, they speak directly, they speak to authority, and they ask for what they want. And so most young Latinas in my neighborhood don't do the things I do because they were taught by their parents it would be inappropriate to speak to authority that way and to ask for what you want. So but anyway, all that to say about that question, both, and I, I want to address it because I think a lot of us are in here that if you're Asian American, you're, 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 your cousins that are not in this country probably think you're not like them, and then the white people here don't think you're like them, so you're like somewhere in between in the hyphen, the liminal, they call that the liminal in between space. So I think that's actually could be very hard, but it's also a blessing. I think that's why Paul was like, I'm, I'm Jewish, and I'm also a Roman, like I have Roman citizenship, and that means I use this passport when I go here, and I use that passport when I go here. I speak this language when I'm here, and I speak this language when I'm here. Um, I dress like this, you know, like I have a suit coat that I wore at the first place. I have this for this one. I'm dressing differently when I go to a college campus. I, I don't, those are all part of me. That's all stuff that's in my closet. It's not like I'm changing for everybody. It's just a part of who I am. All those things are a part of me. So I can speak in both languages and I don't think about which one I'm doing because it's just both a part of me. Um, the suburbs are a part of me. Privilege is a part of me. And also marginalization is a part of me. And the city is a part of me. And I don't belong in any one place. And I think if you're probably at these reconciliation spaces, it's because you probably have some of those skills. You're probably bilingual, multilingual, bicultural, or you've had some experience where you've lived in another country or you, whatever cultures you're crossing. So I think 
To answer that question, I think, um, I think those of us that are doing the work of reconciliation have to, to choose how we want to operate in certain situations. So whoever wrote that comment is right. When I preach at home, I don't preach like I preach when I preach here. It's very different. Um, but that, that's because the space is different and the context is different. And I feel, I feel us as a community different. And so I adjust and I don't think about doing it. I just do it. Um, and that's why I sometimes I have to say like, I'm yelling because I'm Latina, not because I'm angry, you know? <laughs> Um, or in my own space, it's, I'm oftentimes not Pentecostal enough, so I'm like, let's go through this verse like this. And they're like, you're too teachy. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. The seminary is a part of me. I, I, you know, I was trained at a white Western seminary. That's how we do things there. So they're all a part of who I am, and I'm not going to apologize for it. Um, and so I think we, we kind of craft that experience um, along the way. I think to create spaces that accept people, I think that's a different question. And I think what we can do there is have proximity to one another. Like if you're trying to create a space that is hospitable for a certain group of people and you don't have relationship with that group, with more than one person in that group, you're going to assume that every single person, like someone may meet me and say, all Latinas are like Sandra. And it's like, no, they're not all like me. I'm very different. Um, and so you would need to be in proximity to a community in submission to a community. So I would say when you don't have that physical proximity, you can do things like expose yourself to authors and music and theology and podcasts of people of other. Um, so I did this assignment, um, I did this assignment online on Instagram and Facebook, but I always tell people like every year in January, I take everything off my bookshelves. I have like a lot of books, y'all, I like to read. I take all of my books off my bookshelves. And then I go and I put only books written by global voices on my bookshelf. And then I go and I put only books written by women of color on my bookshelf. And then I go and I put only books written by people of color on my bookshelf. And then I go only books written by women or other marginalized communities on my bookshelf. And then I decide from the other 800 books written by white men, which one of those books, I choose 10% of those books to put back on my bookshelf. And it's not because people like my husband, don't, who's white, doesn't have a voice. It's because his voice is overrepresented theologically in the global church. So if, if you only read authors that represent your social, racial, and class space, socioeconomic space, then you are never going to create a space that is hospitable with other people because you don't know what we're thinking. You don't know how we see the passages. And so you don't know our experiences. You don't know why we're traumatized by certain things that are in a room, like even like little main streets, you know, oh, it's so cute, it's such a cute town, it's a little main street. And I'm like, you know, I don't like little main streets. They, they terrorize me because they're attached to cultures and histories in which people like me would never have been accepted or my family would have never been accepted in those spaces. So it's not that they're bad spaces, it's that they have a certain meaning for me. And you wouldn't know that unless we were hanging out and walking down Main Street and all of a sudden I was like, I really don't want to go in that store. You know? So I think we can do this through books. You could do that with your podcasts. Like I would say if you listen to 10 podcasts and all those 10 podcasts are people from the same racial, social, socioeconomic space as you, then delete all of them. Pick one to keep and then fill the rest with voices that are not like yours. And listen to how they experience what's happening in our world, what's happening in your own community what's happening in the church. That's how we change our mind, we listen. Um, and so I listened to a, I listened to a pod, amazing podcast by three Hmong women. I'm not like in a Hmong community, I'm not trying to like prepare to go to do ministry and missions in a Hmong community. I'm just so curious how they read scripture and understand scripture. And their podcast is amazing. It's called Better Than Three Sons. It's amazing. And I just hear their story and their upbringing, and sometimes I connect with them as a child of an immigrant, and sometimes I don't because Latino and Asian cultures are so different. And I'm just like hearing, hearing what is happening in the world through their eyes, and I'm changed by it. So I think we ought to do more of that. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that has a question that would like to ask?
my experience is different uh, from most people here because I am Mexican born and educated part of the way. My parents were educated people. My father was a minister later, and my mother was a, a pharmacist with her own place. And so we, we were well treated. We were successful. This is why we lived in Mexico. When we moved to the United States, we were shocked to see how different the people who had been born here, most of them from the Northern Eurasia, it was very difficult for them to us it seemed like something had gone wrong toward these people and so they could not love themselves or look for, uh, up to themselves the way we just did. We just took it for granted that, you know, my parents were well educated. My father became a minister, my mother was a pharmacist, you know, cousins and, and all those people, they were they all well educated. So a lot of what we see uh, is in, uh, because of where we have lived and what has happened. So I think that there is an opportunity for all of us to learn something uh, if we could spend a little more time, a, a little bit open-minded, and over time maybe the next generation will be able to be more like uh, have the experience that, that we had where we just got I, I feel perfectly at home here. I always have been because you have the same backgrounds that I have had for generations. And so, uh, you know, well, we're Mexican born. We are Mexican Indians. We are very proud of it. We uh, are, you know, for generations forever. And to us, that was just normal. And I think if you try to look that way, you might be able to understand how it can be a good or it can be a bad, depending on how uh, you also um, are able to exchange other people and let them understand. And some people don't want to exchange. That's okay. But I think uh, that's something that, uh, especially to some of us who try to do this, we need to try to help them also. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your, your story and, and your perspective and your comment. Um, I, I think you illustrate very well why it's important for us to think um, communally and collectively. So I shared a little bit of my story with you. The church that I pastor, the church that I was pastoring and that I still go to, but my congregation, um, a lot of the people were always like, why are you always talking about, why are you always talking about ethnicity and race and culture, Sandra? Like, why is that? And I was like, well, I'm studying it. You know, I'm getting my degree. You know, I, um, I'm an anthropologist. You know, because I, I was writing the books on worship. I was doing all those things while I was there, first there. And this one person in particular, I think there was a disconnect between myself and this person. And then they started graduate school. They had grown up in that neighborhood, gone to high school in that neighborhood, gone to college in that neighborhood, and then they started graduate school. And one day, I was sitting in my living room and and it was the person and they were at my door and they were in tears. They said, oh my God, I'm in a class with all white people. It's the first time I've ever been in a setting where I'm the minority. I feel insecure. I feel silenced. This is what happened. And they started sharing all these things that were happening in class. And the person said, I didn't know who else to go to in our church or in our community that had that experience before. Now I know what you were talking about. And so, there is a need for us to know one another's stories, even within our own communities. Because, you know, I don't know, Latina church, I mean, that's just like, you know, <laughs> dozens of countries and cultures and languages, you know. Um, Asian American, I don't even know what that is, you know. Uh, that's like lots of different countries, multiple languages, all sorts of, um, and then we have all of our generation, like all the, the kids we're having, people, old people like me, that are all bicultural, biracial. I mean, I'm raising a black and white son in a Polish Latina family in a Puerto Rican neighborhood. I'm not even Puerto Rican, you know, I'm like, what is happening here? So there are all these things that are influencing us. So our, our, our experiences individually are very different, but that's why it's important for us to collectively speak and understand. That's why I listen to, for example, I'm documented. Like my parents came here in 1965, the last time they changed any immigration laws in our country. So it shows you how outdated it is. 
um, and um, you know there they had green cards they had citizenship and then everything changed and so for a family in my neighborhood who is seeking asylum or who is undocumented their story is not the same as my story even if we both came here and we didn't have money it's not the same because there's status that allows you certain freedoms and so it's not for me to speak it's not for me to only advocate for myself and people like me is for me to see my whole community, my block, my neighbors, the space that I live in, the students at the schools that I work with, and say, what would it look like to make a more hospitable, inclusive, equitable place for black women, for Afro-Latinas? What's their experience? How can I help um, to, to bridge their story? So I think that the issue of storytelling, I just want to say that's so important. If, if, you're, if your small group or college group or, or church does anything, just tell your stories and hold space and be silent and ask questions and don't police one another's stories. Um, because then we just begin to learn, like, what is it that they're going through? Also, generationally, like my mom used to be like, why are you trying to change this country? We came, <laughs> we came to this country for an opportunity. That's why now I feel like you're punishing me for having raised you here. You're like, she's like, because I'm processing all the things that are our history in America. And I'm like, I'm not saying that it's like, a bad country i'm just saying it has it has evil in its history and it should be addressed and i'm not a, i remember one time we were sitting across the kitchen table and i just looked at my mom and i almost yelled at her i was like i'm not a guest here this is my country i was born here whereas my mom always kept a guest mentality as an immigrant like just kind of like do the thing like do the you know i'm a guest i don't want to like oh it's so many opportunities that came here if we would have stayed you know i'm like i'm not a guest this is my country i was born here also, most Mexicans were taken over by the U.S., okay? So I don't know what to say. Like, we're not going to sit around and pretend the last 400 years didn't happen. And especially as a Christian, that's actually when it started for me. The more I read scripture, the more ferocious I got about justice. Because I was like, we are supposed to be the salt and light of the world. And giving up our space for others and taking in other stories and being reconciled to one another is not a burden, it's deliverance from our narcissism and our individualism. It's deliverance from our greed when we're generous. Giving is not a burden. It's a gift. It makes us free. It makes us more human. And so, yeah. Thank I can go you, on for Sandra. That, but... <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, we are actually going to make a transition and go to our breakout sessions. Can we just give a round of applause to Sandra for just her message and thank her you, heart? Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Before we do, I just want to give you a little bit of housekeeping information that's going to be important for you, because right after your breakout sessions, we're going to break into lunch. Our lunch is being catered, and um, you can go ahead and grab your lunch. There's also an amazing prayer walk for those of you who want to participate. And can we just have... Um, I think it's Mike, raise your hand if you're around here. Yes, right here. He's going to be the one leading the prayer walk, so you can meet him um, right in front of the patio, and he will give you guys more instructions on that. There's also going to be a video, 10 videos here about missions um, circulating in our sanctuary, and so if you want to be a part of that, the only thing that we ask is that you do not bring any food in into our sanctuary, and that's going to be also playing during, during lunch. And yeah, so I guess we're going to go into our breakout sessions. And here we go. So Truly and Fully Human with Laura Harvard in the chapel. And if you want to know a little bit more, you can go ahead and open up your booklet and it tells you a little bit more about those sessions. Um, how do we become reconcilers? It begins with empathy with Chrissy Vines in the sanctuary. And then you have racial reconciliation and incarnation approach with Dr. Um, Dwight Radcliffe um, in the Anderson Lounge. So look for someone with a host tag and they will direct you to your actual place if you don't know where to go. Anything else? Um, not that I can think of. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful and blessed day. And we will see you here after lunch. <laughs>